for some of the syntaxes, if I don't specifically talk about some syntax, um, it would be like it was, as I know, is the exact same syntax or an if statement or whatever. Now, certainly, if you have questions about that, ask. Or if there's something that doesn't seem right to you, ask, by all means. Uh, but I don't necessarily go over the syntax of all those because uh, um, I, I assume that, that you, have, you pretty much have those down. Again, maybe a little shaky on some things, that's fine. You can ask questions. Um, I do emphasize stuff, even if it is duplicated in C-sharp, if I think it's a good idea to reinforce. So, for example, you probably created objects in C-sharp, all right? Or you might have, all right? Uh, it's been a while since I taught that class. I don't really remember what, what all you do in it. But uh, uh, despite that, I, I spent a lot of time talking about what happens when you create an object anyhow, all right? So, um, you know, I'll talk about that if I think it needs emphasizing. Um, one thing that you'll find, I think, as you go through this is, is you can understand things on different levels, you know. You can understand things and understand why they work without necessarily knowing all the details, but the more that you know, and as time goes on, you'll, you'll and as, as, as you've been exposed to these concepts over and over again, you'll start to understand them on a deeper level, and then things will become less mysterious for you. That's, that's one of the goals. Uh, I think everyone as a programmer has looked at code that does something that they don't expect, and it's a mystery why it does it, right? It's like, I don't know why it does that. Uh, and then maybe you even fix it to get it to work the way that you want it to. And it works the way that you want it to, but it's like, well, I don't know why that works, but it works. Say, hey, I'm not going to tell anyone I don't know why it works, you know? <laughs> uh, very rarely do people come up to you and ask you to explain, like, why does this work, you know? It's like they're just happy that it works, right? But uh, the more that you understand sort of the underlying concepts, the less uh, mysterious some of these things will be, why things don't work the way that you want them to, or after you get them fixed, why, why they do. So um, we're going to spend, uh, today we're going to review a bit about the constructors that we were talking about last time, and, and about creating an object, and about object references. We're going to review sort of that stuff at the beginning of class. And then we're going to start talking a little bit about methods, uh, which again, I'm I'm sure that you've had methods before, functions, but we're going to look at them um, in detail, and we're going to look at them from the perspective of using objects um, as arguments and return values, all right? Because in my experience, that's something that kind of is a concept that when people see it, it's like, whoa, you know? They may get a function where you send an integer or a string and compute it, but you can actually send an object, too and you can get an object back from a function. So we'll spend some time talking about that. All right, someone tell me in as much detail as you can think of, exactly what this statement does. go for the remainder of class, that's fine. I doubt if you'd be able to. I doubt I could, could do that, but I want detail of what happens when you do this. And just for, for fun, uh, we're going to just you, uh, use the pizza classes. We're not going to look at them in that much detail, so you don't have to remember like every single thing about them, but we we'll use the pizza class. What does this do? What does this statement do? <laughs> Let me rotate it. Upside down. All right. What does that statement do? Yes. It does what? What about it? Okay. 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 I like that answer. We're going to create in the stack a variable named P, and that variable specifically is a pointer or an object reference. And what can we put into this? Variable, 
Go ahead. Almost whatever, but not quite. A, a point or two a pizza object. All right. So I couldn't put a point or two some other object in there. All right. It, it was what's what I was getting at. But very good. Collectively, that's a very good answer. This is saying that we're going to create on the stack. It's a variable we're creating on the stack. Um, a, a variable called p. All right. That variable is going to be an object reference or a pointer. In other words, it's going to contain an address. It's not going to contain the actual value of stuff. It's going to contain a pointer to some place that has that. Uh, and that pointer can contain pointers to pizza objects. Couldn't contain pointers to a customer object, for example, or some other sort of object that we might have in our system. So that's what that does. At this point, there is no, and, and I heard the, the first student that said it, there is no pizza object created, right. So they said you'd still have to create it. So right. So if I tried to do this immediately after, What would happen? Pardon me? It would blow up. It would be a null object reference because we said we have a, po a pointer that's going to point to a pizza. It's almost becoming a, a tongue twister. A pointer that points to a pizza. We're asking for the cost of that pizza, and yet, if these statements were consecutive, all right, and if there wasn't something in between them that did something else, this would be asking the, the cost of a non-existent pizza. So we can't say what the cost of it is, so it will be a null object pointer, or null object reference. What does this do? And let's assume that this statement is still here. What does that statement do? That actually creates the object. It creates a pizza object. Where does it create that pizza object? Place of memory that has a certain name in the heap. All right. Um, what else does it do? There's one other. Th it does two other things actually that, of, that are of note. Exactly. It stores the pointer to that object. It stores the memory location that that object was created in, in the variable p. All right? Because we said p equals this new object. There's one other thing. When we say it creates the object, let's talk about that in more detail. What are the things that happen there? Well, it creates the object in the heap. So one of the things it does is it actually allocates the memory for the object. It creates an object in, in, in the heap. Uh, and so an, another way of saying that is it allocates the memory for it. What code runs when we say new pizza? The constructor. The no argument constructor. Now. The no argument constructor can exist one of two ways. All right? This is a little tricky. Number one, if we don't declare any constructors, a default constructor is created for you. And that default constructor doesn't do anything at all other than allocating the memory. So it allocates the memory, doesn't do any initialization, it's just there. You could write your own no argument constructor in which you defaulted things to certain values. All right. Um, for example, if you knew that the most commonly ordered pizza that was ordered was a, uh, a small, thin crust pepperoni, you could default the pizza to small, thin crust pepperoni. All right. So what do we do in constructors, essentially, besides the allocation of memory? What code do we put in there? Initialization of attributes. Yeah, initialization of, attributes of, of values in the object. Remember, a class 
is sort of a generic description of objects. Objects are members of that class, individual uh, members of that class. Objects have what are called instance variables. They're called, sometimes called instance variables because each object, another way to say object is say an instance of a class. You're an instance of student. You're, you're, you're an example. When you hear the word instance, think an example of. You're an example of a student. All right? Everyone has certain parameters as a student, certain properties. Birthday, uh, name, address, phone number, other stuff. That's defined in the class, all the attributes that a person, that all people are going to have, all students are going to have. Each member of that class has their own set of values for that. All right? Uh, so everyone has a birth date, everyone has a name, everyone has an address, everyone has a phone number, and so on. All right? So what we can do in a constructor is we can create the object, allocate the memory, and set certain variables, certain properties. We can either default those properties, or we can pass them as arguments and set them that way. When you're creating an, uh, a class and you're looking at what constructors to, to create, if someone doesn't tell you what constructors to create, like I say on an, on an assignment, create these two constructors, if no one tells you that, you have to imagine, like, what does it make sense, you know, what will at least a member of this class have? And, and create constructors that, and, and are there any properties that I can default? And then create the class based on those assumptions that, you know, hey, the one, the things that the class has to have, I might make an argument in a constructor for. So a student has to have a name. I probably wouldn't create a no argument constructor for a student. I might. But I, pro I might probably wouldn't because every student has to at least have a name, right? It's possible that a brand new student wouldn't have a student number, right? Or a student, you know, might not have a phone or could be moving so they're between addresses or whatever. But everyone coming in is going to have a name, right? So I probably would create a constructor that requires a name. Then I might have other constructors that has a name and an address, a name, address, phone number, whatever. So depending on what I get in. You're providing a service to the programmers that are going to use your component later on by giving them a variety of ways that they can create a member of this object. So you give the ways that make sense, all right? Um, if I was a rent-a-car company, for example, all right, um, I might rent two-wheel drive cars and four-wheel drive cars. The default probably is two-wheel drive car, right? If you just go in and just rent a car, you're probably going to get a two-wheel drive car. You're not going to get a four-wheel drive car. All right, unless you ask for it. So if I had a constructor for car, I might allow them to default the value for two-wheel drive to something. So how do we create a constructor? What's the syntax look like to create a constructor? Like a method. Public. Then the class. Whatever arguments you want, and then the code. Remember, if you create any constructor, your default compiler-generated customer, uh, not customer, constructor goes away. So you, you no longer have use of that. If you want there to be a no-argument constructor, you have to create it yourself. What happens here? For simplicity, I'm just going to use a no argument constructor just so I don't have to write so much. What happens there? OK. Let's go down it a step at a time. Pizza. P does what? 
it creates a pointer. It creates a pointer that's going to point to a pizza object. It creates it on the stack. Pizza Q does the same thing except the pointer is named Q. Pizza Q equals new pizza. We talked about that. Um, oh, actually, I don't. Actually, let me get rid of this line. This is sort of in two halves. The first half does the same thing that this instruction does. It creates a pointer called Q that's going to point to a pizza. This does what we said it before. It creates a new pizza object, puts the pointer in the variable Q, and runs the no argument constructor. Either the default constructor that we didn't create and it was generated for us, or um, the um, uh, one that we wrote that maybe set some defaults. All right, if the defaults are reasonable. Now, finally, what does this do? Takes the contents of Q and puts them in the P. What are the contents of Q? Again, the contents of Q are a pointer. So P now points to the same object that Q does. So if I said P set pepperoni to true, How many pizza objects are affected? One. That, boy, that was meant to be a trick question. Good job. Because there's only one pizza object. How can I tell there's only one pizza object? Well, a cheat way, and this isn't always right, is I only got one new here. So I only made at most one object. All right? I say at most because it's possible that object got destroyed. I might not have any objects, but I know my code doesn't destroy any objects. So there's only one pizza object. So I've added, pe I've added pepperoni to one pizza. That's it. That pizza, however, is pointed to by two references. You can just think of it like, uh, you know, like you could find your house. Your house is pointed to by latitude and longitude. Your house is pointed to by a street address. It's not like there's two houses. There's just two ways to point to that house, to describe where that house is. Kind of the same thing with, with objects and object references. One piece object, that piece object sort of has two pointers associated with it. So we could access that piece object one of two different ways. All right, I think that's enough for now. Um, let's talk about methods more closely. All right, methods, functions, pretty much mean the same thing. All right, the general rule for a, um, um, a function is it's going to start with either public, private, or protected. One of these three words. We're not going to talk about protected right now because protected deals with inheritance, and we haven't gotten that far yet. Public means that other classes can call that function. All right. Private means that this function can only be called within this one class. All right. So simple enough. Most of our functions are going to be public. Because most of our functions, we're going to want to be able to call from the outside world. By the outside world, I mean by, uh, from other classes. Um, in our pizza example, we need to be able to set whether that pizza has pepperoni or not from our test class. If later on we were to write a GUI for this, we'd be setting the, whether that pizza had pepperoni or not from within our GUI class. So we're going to always want, uh, for, most, for the most part, we're going to want these to be um, public. You then have either a void or a return value. All right. Void simply means that the object uh, doesn't return anything. You can write functions that don't return anything. All right. Um, pretty you know, they do something. Maybe, maybe all the function does is prints out something. It doesn't return anything. It just goes and does its job, and its job is to print out an invoice for the customer or print out a receipt for the customer for their pizza. Maybe that's all it does, all right? In which case, it doesn't really return anything. It just prints it out, all right? Or it can return a return value, 
all right? The return value could either be a pointer, that is an object reference, or a primitive. Here's the key, here's the important thing to remember. Void means it doesn't return anything. If it returns a return value, it can only return one thing. So I can't write a function that returns two integers. I can't write a function that returns two pizza objects. I can't write a function that returns two of anything. I can only write a function that returns one of something. All right? Now, not to muddy the waters further, but I could write a function to return an array of pizzas, all right? Because that's one thing, an array. So that's sort of one of the ways that you can kind of get around this rule, is that you could only return one of something, but the thing that you return can be big, and it can be complicated, all right? Normally, when we write functions, and correct me if I'm wrong, like in the C-sharp class and functions like that, most of the functions we write, uh, maybe prior to this class, and maybe I'm wrong, but I get the perception based on what I hear students say, that they write functions that return like a numeric value. All right, You return um, some calculation. Or you return a Boolean that says true or false. That yes, this code is valid, false, this code. Or yes, these values are valid, false, these values are not valued, or something like that. The one thing that you have to remember is we could write functions as well that can return object references. All right? We're not returning objects. We're returning object references. So if I say public pizza, what I'm going to return is I'm going to return an object reference to a pizza. So if I return a pizza, it's not like I'm creating a new pizza. I'm not creating a new pizza object and returning that. I'm not returning the pizza object, an old pizza object. I'm returning a pointer to a pizza. Which means if I do something to that pizza, it's still, again, just like the P and Q example. There's still only one pizza on the, on the heap. It's just, I just now have another new reference to it. All right? So we do the return an integer, a Boolean, a primitive, an object reference, or nothing. That's our three choices. But we could only return one of something. All right? Then we have the name of the function. I'm going to write a silly function here that might not be so silly. Give me a function that gives me the longest bake time uh, from a list of pizzas. All right? So, for example, if you have a pizza that's going to take 10 minutes to bake and a pizza that's going to take 20 minutes to bake, you tell the person that your order is going to be ready in 20 minutes, right? Because whatever one is longest, that's going to determine how long um, it's going to take uh, to do it. So I could return the pizza that gives me, that's the longest one to bake. Because another thing, practically, if I'm the pizza chef, I want to put the one as long as the bake in first, right? So I might be able to get other things done if I have one of those pizzas that only bakes in a couple of minutes, a few minutes. Then within parentheses, I have a list of arguments. Now, there can be no arguments. Or there can be a bunch of arguments, all right? That's different than a return value, right? A return value, you could only have one thing, all right? You can only return one thing. An argument, however, uh, or your argument list, you could have no arguments, something you don't really have to give an argument to, or you can give a, 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 a multiple arguments, all right? What can those arguments be? They can be 
For now, anyhow, they can be two things. They can be primitives, or they can be object references. So I could write a function that said, public double cap pizza discount. And I could pay an argument a pizza class, a pizza uh, object, I mean, and a uh, discount rate. When we write the list of arguments, we have to say the type of argument and the name of the argument. The name of the argument is what we're going to refer to that as inside, uh, inside, the, uh, uh, inside the function. Now, let me write something. I'm going to write a little snippet of code. All right? Let's say this is a function. Doesn't matter what it's called. And I have an int x that equals zero. I have a function here public void do something. and accepts as an argument an integer argument. System dot out dot print ln. Arg system dot out dot print ln x and I say do something and I pass x. All right, let's think about this for a second. What will this print output if this is the exact code? This, this will output 10. Does everyone see how that's going to output 10? All right. How's it going to output 10? I said x equal to 0. I call my function do something, and I give it the value of x. So x gets put into this variable called arg, right? That's how an argument works. When you call a function, whatever is in here gets put in here. All right? So I now have an integer called arg that has the same value as x does, which is 0. I add to it. I get 10 and I output the value of 10. Okay? Pretty straightforward. What will this output? This will output 0. All right? That makes sense, right? If you consider that how primitives work. Let's look at this from the perspective of the stack and heap. Of course, we, ain't, we don't have the heap in this case because we only have primitives. In x, we create a variable called x that accepts integers, and we initialize the value to 0. I call this function. I create a new variable called arg, and I get the value of x. 
So it has a value of zero. I go and add one to arg, I get a value of 10. I add arg, I get a value of 10. I return from the function, and then I add x, and x still has a value of zero. All right? If I wanted x to change, what would I have to do? I'd have to make this guy return an int. Then I could say x equals the value, do something on x. Then it would return the 10, and then the 10 would be put in the x. All right? So remember, the way that primitives work is primitives, when I assign one primitive to another, it copies the value. It copies a primitive value. And the value for a primitive is an integer, or a double, or a Boolean. So if I copy, if I say x equals y, I have two variables, and let's say x equals 20. I have two variables that each have their own value. And that value happens to be both 20 for both of them. All right? But if I change one, then y becomes 25, and I have not affected the value of x, because the value of x is separate. Objects going to be a little bit different than that. Let's say I have this. Pizza p equals new pizza. And I have just sets. We're going to look at whether it's pepperoni or not. And I say P set pepperoni false. This is some function. We don't care what it's called. I have another function, public void. Do something. That accepts a pizza argument. And I say arg dot set pepperoni true. Now a system out print, I'm just going to write SOP from now on so I don't have to write all those, system out print, arg get pepperoni, system out print ln p get pepperoni, Then I do something, and I pass the pizza P, then I output pepperoni again. Okay, let's go look at these prints. What's this one going to print? Is it going to print true, or is it going to print false? It's going to print true, right? We called this with a pepperoni, uh, with a pizza object. We set that pizza object's pepperoni property to true. We print out pepperoni property. It's going to print out true. We create a new pizza object. We set its pepperoni property to false. We ask what's the value of the pepperoni property going to be what? False. So that's going to print false. I call this function. Now, what's this going to print out? I, I didn't hear. I, I heard mumbling. OK. We have a vote for true. Does anyone have a vote for false? 
Does anyone have a vote for they just want some pizza now? All right. It's actually going to return true. It's actually going to print true. Why is that? Well, remember. Remember how this works. Pizza P equals new pizza. What does that do? It creates a stack variable, or it creates a, 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 a variable on the stack called P that's going to hold a pizza pointer. It then creates on the heap a pizza object at some location, let's say location 5,000, it stores that location in P, all right? This pizza object has all the properties associated with the pizza. It's a pizza object. So it has of crust. It has, uh, what were the other choices? A size. And it has... a pepperoni property. We set that pizza's pepperoni property to false. So P is dealing with the object that's in location 5000. We set the pepperoni property to false. So after this line of code, after this line of code, if I print the pepperoni property of that pizza, it's going to be false. I then my function that says do something with P. I have a pizza arg. Pizza arg, unlike int arg, doesn't create a new integer. It creates a object reference. All right. So there's now a variable on the stack called arg that is going to point to a pizza object. What do we set it to? We set the contents of P. What are the contents of P? Well, it's the pointer, right? Because that's what object references hold. They hold a pointer. They don't hold the actual object itself. Or like with a primitive where it holds the value of the primitive. It holds a pointer to the object. So now in this instruction where I say arg set pepperoni true, that says, well, find the pizza that's in this location, the location called arg, and set its pepperoni flag to true. So we go and change this to true. This code executes. All right. We come back to here, and then say pepperoni that's pointed to by p, what is the value of your pepperoni status? And the pepperoni, the pizza pointed to by P is at location 5,000, and its pepperoni status is set to true. So this is, a, this is a big difference in the way that functions work with object references versus integers and pr other primitives. All right? It's important to keep this in mind and to understand why it works. You're always, you're not sending a value, you're sending a reference, you're sending a pointer to uh, an object. So if I send a primitive to a function and I change that value of that primitive, the original primitive doesn't get changed because we are working on a copy in the function. If, however, I send an object to a function, all right, if I send an object to a function and I change something in that, inside that object, the original does get changed because we didn't send a copy of that object. We sent a pointer to that object where to find it. All right? Real, real, real important to understand that. A similar sort of thing works with return values too. All right? So you can return things, and you're returning in the case of... Um, in the case of um, a primitive, you're returning a value. You're, and, and if we store that value in a variable, we're going to copy that value from one place to another. So we have a copy of the value. In the case of uh, returning a object, we're actually returning an object reference. So we're returning a pointer. And so we're not creating a new object. We're not creating a copy. We're creating a pointer to point to another object. All right? Questions about that? 
All right. So we're going to start passing around and getting, passing around and returning objects. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to my pizza example an order object. All right. I'm going to add an order object. If I think about this, if I'm designing a system and I went and talked to the person that runs the pizza place, what are they going to tell me? They're going to say, people call in with orders. All right? These orders have a list of pizzas on them, have, have any number of pizzas on them. Someone might order one pizza, someone might order ten pizzas. So there's no predefined number of pizzas that make up an order. Could be one, could be ten. All right? Now, if I was designing the system, this is similar to database design in a way, all right? But if I was designing a system, in those couple of sentences, what are the classes involved? They are probably going to be the nouns that I said, right? Nouns, person, place, or thing. So in that sentence, people call in and place orders. Those orders have one or several pizzas on them. So I'm probably going to have a people class. We'll probably call that customer, right? Because it's not just any person, you know. Uh, employees, we might have an employee class later on, and they're also people. So we would, we would say customer class. We'd have an order class, and we would have a pizza class, all right? And then we would start identifying the properties and uh, the methods that exist on the different classes. We already developed the pizza class. And we certainly could make that more extensive, right? We only have one topping. We could have a bunch of toppings on it. We only have a few sizes and so on. We could do air checking in that class and so on. Some of this we'll do later on in the semester. Some of it, uh, you know, we're not necessarily going to go back and, and, and add a bunch of toppings to the pizza. Besides, I don't like too many toppings on pizza. All right, we're going to keep it simple. All right. Now, what do you think we're going to have in an order class? What does an order consist of? If you think about an order, here's where it helps to think in real world terms. What do you think of when you think of a pizza order? Okay. 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 Let's talk about the order. We're going to have a list of pizzas. How many could there be? Anywhere from one to unlimited, really, for our purposes, unlimited. There probably is a practical limit, right? How much you could eat in a day, or how big your oven is, or whatever. But for our purposes, we're going to say, well, it's, it's unlimited, all right? So we have a list of pizzas. Now, you raise a good point by saying there is things like toppings and the size of the pizzas and the kind of crust and all that. This is where object-oriented design, um, your job is, is to think of those things and think, what is that really an attribute of? Is that an attribute of the order? In other words, I'm going to place an order that is topped with pepperoni. No, you're going to place an order for a pizza that is topped with pepperoni, another pizza that is topped with mushrooms, another pizza that's topped with anchovies, and so on. All right? So the different properties for pizza, things like the toppings and the uh, kind of crust and the size are attributes of the pizza. They're not attributes of orders. But the list of pizzas that you order is a property of the order, right? Because I am ordering pizzas, all right? Now, depending on whether we, like, had, a, like, a customer loyalty program or something, like, where we kept track of, of how many pizzas you've ordered to give you a discount or something like that, maybe we would get, like, maybe we would have, like, a customer class that kept track of you and how many orders you had or something like that. We're not going to worry about that for now. This is just a mom and pop place. 
hey, we don't give no discounts because our pizza is the best, right? So you don't get no discounts. It's your privilege to be eating our pizza. That's, that's reward enough for you to be our customer, all right? So we're going to have some customer information. Now, that customer information could be, there could be a name associated with the order, a phone number, and maybe, let's say, uh, an address, city, state, and zip, and maybe an indication if it's delivery or not. So those would be the attributes of a pizza. I'm sorry, of an order. We're going to keep our pizza class pretty much the same as it has been, knowing that we could expand it. Maybe we'll add some stuff here and there to it, but knowing that we can expand it. Yes, you could. That's why I was getting at before. If you wanted to keep track of things for a customer, like uh, you know, how many do they have a, a free pizza coming or something like that? Maybe there would be a customer class, all right? Or they could just be considered attributes of the order. Again, it really depends on how involved. So the, to answer your question, yes, you're right, but we're not going to do that in this example, all right? We should be able to demonstrate what I want to demonstrate without doing that part of it. You know, that, that might be something that we add later on. But for now, we're just going to consider that an attribute of the order. The name of the person, the, the, the phone number, the address, whether it's pickup or delivery. All right? What are some methods that we would want on the order? Things that aren't attributes, but may be calculated. OK, we want a price of the order. Amount of time. We could imagine a whole bunch of other things, right? We could imagine to say, is it eligible for delivery? All right? If you give the address, we could do some calculation with Google Maps. All right, that would go out and look to see are they within our delivery range. Maybe we deliver within two miles of, of our pizza place. And we could look and say, hey, is this address between this address, between this address and the pizza place, is it more than two miles? Because maybe, you know, maybe they're not eligible. Maybe you've got to come and pick it up. All right? Uh, so that would be, uh, that would be uh, an option. All right? How are we going to calculate the, the, the total cost of the order? Exactly. Each pizza could have its own price, right? Because they could order one large and one small. So the large would have one price, the small would have another. So you're right, though. The price of the, pe of the order is the price of the sum of the prices of each pizza. All right? And there's like fancy object oriented words for that. All right? Um, where, like, we're actually going to calculate the, the price of the order by asking the pizza how much it costs and just add it up. All right? I think that's called delegation. I'm not big on the fancy words all right, like for, for things, but it's probably good to, to hear them at least once. Now, there could be like a delivery charge, too, added on. Maybe we charge $5 for delivery. All right? um, so you, you pay whatever, and then you pay you know, uh, extra for delivery. So it might be the sum of all the pizzas plus any delivery charge. What would how long it's going to take to make be? It would probably be the bake time of the longest pizza, assuming you have enough ovens. Exactly. Uh, and uh, assuming you have enough oven space. Because it might be that you have one pizza, maybe you can only bake two pizzas at a time, let's say. Someone's running this with their easy bake oven. All right. So you can only do two pizzas at a time. So maybe one pizza takes 25 minutes, one takes, and the, and the other two take 15 minutes. Well, then you'd have to figure it out a different way. But for simplicity, we're going to assume you have enough oven space, all right? And in which case, the total time would be the time of the longest pizza, 
All right? Okay. What we will do, uh, there, there, there could be any number of other things. For example, we could have a estimation of how long it will take to get to this place. You know, uh, maybe it's a minute away, maybe it's 10 minutes away. And we could have a lot of other functions on this order. We're going to focus on these two. How much time it's going to take and what the price of the order is. Next time we'll actually create this object and, uh, and, and run some of these functions. The key things that we're going to get are going to be, number one, we're going to be passing objects as arguments and maybe return values. I don't remember. But passing re objects as, as return values. The second thing that we're going to do is we are going to, um, um, what was I going to say here? Um, oh, we have to store a list of pizzas. So we've talked about arrays already, but there's a better way than arrays. And we'll talk about that next time. All right, any questions? We'll see you in lab.